Hey, good morning. Welcome to Gateway. Thanks again for being here. And uh, uh, for those that don't know, our senior pastor, Pastor Dave, he's in uh, Hawaii for, for work. Um, actually, he's probably on his way back. Uh, he's probably traveling today. But yeah, he's, uh, he's, over, he's been over there for almost three weeks. It's a rough work life, isn't it? Um, I asked him, like, when do we, as the church staff, get to do that? Hasn't been approved yet. But, uh, but anyways, for those that don't know me, I'm Joel Copley. I'm the St. Thomas Campus Minister, and, uh, and um, you get the privilege. I'm going to call it a privilege. Probably you can tell me afterwards. I'm preaching today, so there we go. All right. Um. This might be the first time I've preached in like almost two years here. But anyways, um, we've been doing this series called Win the Day, and uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of a, a history lesson. So on November 9th, 1847, there was a civil engineer named Charles Ellett Jr. who was commissioned to build a bridge over the Niagara Gorge. Uh, the problem when it comes to building a bridge that will span an 820-foot uh, chasm with a 20... 225 foot cliff on either side is how do you get the first cable to the other side? So enter Theodore Graves Hewlett, a local iron worker who suggested something a little off the wall. Uh, he suggested they hold a kite flying contest with a $10 cash prize. And it was a 15 year old boy named Homan Wash who would take home that prize for getting his kite across the chasm first. You know, the next day they attached a stronger line to that kite string and then a rope and then a cable with 36 strands of 10 gauge wire. And it would become the first railway suspension bridge strong enough to support a 170 ton locomotive. And it all started with one kite string. So do not despise the day of small beginnings. Uh, if you do the little things like they're big things, God will do big things like they're little things. And like I said, we've been in this series called Win the Day, and we have covered the first three habits. Flip the script, kiss the wave, eat the frog, and today it looks like our message is titled Fly a Kite. And man, am I happy about this because I've been pretty frustrated with some of you, and I've been really wanting to tell some of you to go fly a kite. Um, oh, fly the kite. Okay, no, I wasn't, that's a mistake. I wasn't really upset with anyone. Um, I'm not frustrated. Um, I take that back. I guess that might be a message the next time I preach. We'll see if I'm really actually frustrated with anyone. Uh, all right, so fly the kite. Habit number four to help us win the day. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be hanging out in the book of uh, Zechariah, chapter four. So you can go ahead and head over there. And as you head that way, and as we dive into what it looks like to fly a kite, uh, let me lead off with this. How you do anything is how you will do everything. How you do anything is how you do everything. So if you're faithful with a little, you will be faithful for, with a lot. Perhaps you've been in a job interview where you've been asked some odd questions. And for sure there are some, some weird people conducting interviews. But sometimes they are just filling out your character and your work ethic with, with the small things. I don't know if I've ever shared the story about my interview for uh, being on staff here at Gateway, but we were at the Bob Evans in Taze Valley, and there were like, uh, Megan and I were there, and I think there were like eight other people, most of the Taze Valley staff, uh, Pastor Dave, uh, one of the elders. Uh, I was actually interviewing for the student minister position at the Taze Valley campus, and you know, Steve Harley was leading the interview because it was his campus, you know, someone working for him, and he was asking the questions, and then like right in the middle of the interview, uh, Pastor Dave started asking questions, and I was like, man, these are some really weird questions. And then like, I'm answering questions by describing how I organize my pantry at home. And I'm like, man, this is so weird. What in the world does that have to do with student ministry? Like, I'm just, all right, we'll just finish this interview. Megan, we're probably not getting this job. <laughs> and, uh, but unbeknownst to me, in the middle of this interview, uh, Pastor Dave had texted Steve and said, hey, we're not hiring him for the student minister position. 
at Taze Valley. I got something else in mind. And so all of his questions were for a position that I didn't know about. So I'm asking questions, trying to think about student ministry, when in reality it was about something else. And so I was just completely thrown off. Um, but some of his questions, I think, were trying to figure out about some small things that might show their character. You know, um, sometimes something as small as someone stopping to pick up trash in the parking lot instead of walking past it can tell you a lot about their character and their leadership. Do you care enough about your workplace to stop and pick up the trash that's been passed by all day long? You know, there are people who will say they will give more generously when they make more money. Okay, that sounds great, but I'm not sure I believe you because if, you're gonna, if you aren't generous with a little time, with a little talent, or a little treasure, are you going to be generous with a lot? You know, generosity starts now. There isn't a switch that's flipped when you reach a certain level of abundance. No, the switch needs to get flipped in your heart long before that. You know, I know people say they will serve when they have more time. Uh, first of all, where are you magically getting all this time? You know, it reminds me of a picture I saw a couple weeks back. And we'll put this picture up here. It says, me in 2019. If I could just have a week with nowhere to go and nothing to do, I could get my house in order. After COVID, nope, nope, that was not the problem. That was not the problem. My wife's in here, and I'm, I'm um, this house in order part. Uh, I'm going to tell you, she's been doing a lot of great work at our house. I'm the problem. I will say that. Um, so good job on doing all that stuff. But listen, time just doesn't magically appear. You don't find time. You make time. I know people who say they will step up when the big opportunity presents itself. Not if you aren't seizing the small opportunities that are all around you all the time. Uh, this, this book that we're doing this message series off of is uh, written by Mark Batterson. And he mentions a friend that used to train Marines. And there was a sign at the basic school that said, you don't rise to the occasion, you revert to your training. To do the big, you have to start with the small. And it's okay to dream big. You know, show me the size of your dreams, and I'll show you the size of your God. You know, I'm sure some people have heard that before. But go after a dream that's destined to fail without God's help. But you can't just dream big and hope it happens. You have to do the natural so that God can do the super. You have to start small, and you have to think long. That is what flying the kite is all about. A single kite string can eventually become a bridge between two countries. All right, so in Zach Zechariah chapter 4, uh, let me set the context a little bit for you. Z Zerubbabel, one of my favorite Old Testament names because I can pronounce it, is a leader of this remnant that returns to the nation of Judah with a God-sized vision to rebuild the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed in 586 B.C. About 50 years later, Zerubbabel is looking at the ruins, and the Lord says to him in verse 6, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. And we read in Psalm 127, Unless the Lord builds this house, the builders will labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. So I have a confession this morning. You know, without the Holy Spirit, without the help of the Holy Spirit, I am merely below average. Uh, you know, maybe some of you all think I'm merely below average with the Holy Spirit. That could be it. But imagine what kind of mess I would be with, without him, you know. Um, you know, I go into work every week relying on the Holy Spirit to allow me to do the work that is set before me. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, on my own I can accomplish li a little, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. Jesus said in John 15, 5, apart from me you can do nothing the Holy Spirit is the X factor. It's the difference between the best you can do and the best that God can do. And let me tell you something this morning. God wants to do things in you and through you that are beyond your ability, beyond your resources, and beyond your imagination. Why? So that he gets the glory. And how will that happen? By his spirit. Not by your might or your power, but by his spirit. So in verse 7 in uh, Zechariah, it says, what are you, mighty mountain? You ever been there before? Whatever the obstacle is in front of you, you start talking to it. 
See, there comes a moment when you've got to stop talking to God about your mountains and start talking to the mountains about your God. You declare his power, his grace, his peace, his glory, his love, his goodness, his healing. You don't deny the obstacle or the odds. You face the facts head on, but you do it with an unwavering faith. You don't lose faith in the end of the story, and you take whatever you're facing head on as a child of God, as a follower of Christ, and as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. But there's one caveat. Every, every prayer we pray has to, has to pass a, a twofold litmus test. Is it in the will of God, and is it for the glory of God? If it's not, then you need to start over. And if it, but if it is, we press on. I'm not sure what mountain stands in your way right now. It could be anxiety. Philip was sharing a story with me about a, a kid at camp this week that showed up on Sunday. The camp has this thing called a giant swing. Like, they, they take 10 kids and pull this rope, and it pulls these other kids way up in the air. And then they let go, and the kid swings back and forth. And, you know, you're probably 25 feet up in the air. I don't, I don't know for sure, but it's a giant swing to some of these kids, you know? And this kid came in Sunday being anxious about riding the uh, giant swing on Thursday and he was more anxious and more anxious throughout the week so maybe it's anxiety for you maybe it's addiction maybe it's anger maybe it's injustice maybe it's terminal illness maybe it's depression frustration fear it could go on and on you know you might be facing a mountain range it's in, those mo- it's in those moments, though, that you have to fall back on what you know for sure. It's in those moments when the, when the mighty mountain stands in your path that you cling to the promises of our God. And it's in those moments that you remember that our God is still the God who makes highways through the sea. He's still the God who makes the sun stand still. And he's still the God who turned water into wine. And he's still the God who moves the mountains. And if God did it before, he can do it again. And if he's done it for me, then he can do it for you. Why? Because he's the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. All right, back to Zechariah chapter 4. Let's drop down to verse 10, and uh, this is where we fly the kite. In verse 10 we read, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. I said I could pronounce that, but I got it the first time, all right? Um, Zerubbabel's hand. So for context, the plumb line was an ancient measuring tape. Notice that God is rejoicing before they even build. They don't even have permits. They haven't broken ground. Zerubbabel has just grabbed the measuring tape. You know, now maybe some of you guys can relate to this. You've been putting off that honeydew list for so long that your wife starts cheering when you merely pick up a hammer. You know, um, my wife cheers when I like get up out of the recliner, you know, that's when, that's when she knows something might actually happen. Um, you know, one of the reasons I love God, because nothing is too small for God. The next time you think your life is too small for God, remember that he started cheering when Zerubbabel picked up the measuring tape. God celebrates the small steps of faith. The small acts of kindness. Nothing is too big for our God, but nothing is too small either. He celebrates the small steps of faith and the small acts of kindness. What you might think is small and insignificant, God is giving a standing ovation for. So don't ever think that your steps of faith or kindness go unnoticed by God, no matter how big or how small they may be. You know, I want to pivot to another person involved with the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem Uh, after returning from exile, and that's Nehemiah. So if you want to head over to Nehemiah 1, if you want to stay with me here. Uh, Nehemiah was the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes during the time that the Jewish people returned, and he is greatly troubled to hear about the condition of the people in the city. Nehemiah's compassion drives him to action, and he he has the dream of rebuilding his city, which is no easy task. I think we are often uh, easily overwhelmed by the size and the scope of our dreams and goals that God has set before us. You know, that's why 75% of New Year's resolutions fell in the first month. That's why 83% of people want to write a book, but very few do. 
We see the mountain of work lying ahead uh, and give up before we even get started. But here's the thing. You can't finish what you don't start. It doesn't matter whether you're writing a book, running a marathon, getting a graduate degree. You've got to fly the kite. You've got to start small and then continue to build until you've eventually bridged the gap between you and what you hope to accomplish. But you've got to fly the kite before you can span the gap. So there's three keys this morning to flying the kite. Number one is dream big, but start small. Number two is expect opposition and plan accordingly. And three, if you want every day to count, you need to count every day. All right, so number one, dream big, but start small. Just like home and wash, you have to start uh, with the kite string before you can span the gap with the suspension cable. Nehemiah had a dream that a city would one day reach its former glory. He loved a city and his people so much. Just hearing the distress that his people were going through and the condition that, of his city caused him to weep. And so he develops this big dream to rebuild the city. But he doesn't get ahead of himself. He doesn't let his excitement get ahead of him. Instead, before he starts anything else, Nehemiah starts small. He prays. Prayer is such a small step, but it has giant ramifications if we just start with it. Nehemiah knew that in order for this project to be successful, God had to be involved. He doesn't want his labor to be in vain, so he makes sure God is behind him. And this wasn't just a quick prayer, just to clue God in on what he planned to do. Instead, in chapter 1, verse 4, we see, For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah was laying this at the feet of God, seeking his blessing. In verse 11, it says, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and the prayer of your servant who delights in revering your name. Give your servant, or your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. You know, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency of getting ahead of myself when I get a little excited about something. I think a lot of us have a tendency to ask God to bless the decisions that we have already made. It reminds me of the uh, ask for permission or ask for forgiveness debate, only it's more ask for guidance or ask for blessing. But Nehemiah knew that he wouldn't be able to do this without God's help. He was going to need God's super to team up with his natural, so he invited God into his dream. And I'm sure spanning the Niagara Gorge started out as a big idea and a problem with no solution. Uh, wouldn't it be great if type of thing. But as you survey the 825 foot gap, you could get overwhelmed with the enormity of the, the, enormity of the job laying before you. Nehemiah could have easily been, become overwhelmed with the size of the project that was in his future. But instead, he started with a kite string and went from there. So by all means, dream big. Make God-sized goals. Stretch your faith in new ways. And as long as it's in the will of God and for the glory of God, shoot high so you can give him all the glory he deserves. But you have to start small by inviting him in through prayer. And then number two, expect opposition and plan accordingly. You know, not everyone was on board with the rebuilding of Jerusalem. You know, Nehemiah faced opposition from three specific individuals and their people throughout the restoration of the wall. In Nehemiah 4, we see that when Sam Ballot heard that, that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews to, and, uh, he ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble? burned as they are. You know, I just, uh, y'all ever seen Aladdin? Like, I always think of, like, Sam Ballad as one of those, like, bad guys from Aladdin. Like, big mustache, like one of those curved swords, like, you know, going after people. I see a few smiles. Thanks for participating. Um, but I'm going to continue on in uh, uh, chapter four here. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what are they building? What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. 
Later on, Nehemiah mentions a man named Geshem, the Arab, along with the rest of our enemies in chapter 6. These men were very angry that Nehemiah and the people were rebuilding the wall, and they plotted together to fight against them. As if there weren't enough problems trying to rebuild this wall, they are now facing an opposition. So imagine Holman Welsh comes to the Niagara Gorge that day, and on top of the distance of the chasm, on top of the wind, on top of the conditions, on top of the fact that he's trying to land a kite 850 feet away from where he is standing, on top of all of that, imagine a group of protesters walk up behind him and start hurling insults at him. And then they start threatening him and saying they're going to throw him off the cliff. That's crazy, right? But whatever your goals are, even when you break it into smaller habits, you have to expect that there will be some sort of opposition. Maybe it's not a group of angry protesters, although you never know these days. But there will be some opposition that you face, whether it be earthly or spiritual. And look at how Nehemiah responded to his opposition here in verse, five, or verse 9. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. And then down in 13, therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons and daughters, your wives, and your homes. He went to God in prayer first and then planned for the opposition. When you face the opposition that threatens your work on your dreams or goals, remember that there is no greater weapon than that of prayer. Let's go to the person that can do something about it. No matter what it is you're trying to accomplish, God is there waiting for you to depend on him. So expect opposition and pray continuously. But also plan accordingly. Be ready with a plan B. That so your dreams or your goals are not destroyed by a little adversity. Uh, just a few years ago, there was a big storm that came through here and uh, had the big floods up around Clendenin and in all that area. Do you know where I was when that storm came through? With like 80 elementary kids out at church camp. Do you know what that storm did? It knocked out power. Um, I had to entertain... 80, number one, keep 80 elementary kids calm during a crazy storm like that, and then entertain 80 elementary kids while there was no power. And I remember several people there coming up to me afterwards going, I don't know how you did that, but you did that so well. And I'm like, it's because you have to plan accordingly. Number one, if I freak out, what are the kids going to do? They're going to freak out. Like, if I don't have things planned for the worst case scenario... The things aren't going to go well when the worst case scenario comes up. So you have to plan uh, for adversity. Um, but Nehemiah didn't give up in the face of his opposition. Instead, he adapted his plan to allow for the people to work and defend against attacks at the same time. In the face of opposition, you have to win the day. Don't get discouraged when the work gets harder or when people tell you that you can't do it or when you aren't seeing the results that you would like, take each day, one day at a time, you can overcome the negativity and opposition for today, and then you can do it again tomorrow. Which brings us to number three. If you want every day to count, count every day. If something matters, you count it. We know ages. We celebrate people's birthdays. We count the years someone has been alive. You know how many years you've been married. Today, I know specifically that I've been married 12 years because today's my anniversary. <laughs> and that clap was for Megan for putting up with me for 12 years. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, you know how many years you've been at your job. Uh, but what about days? Do you know how many days you've been married or been at your job? 
And, you know, you could probably figure it out if I give you a few minutes. You know, take the years, multiply by 365, carry the two, all that good stuff. But who just knows without even thinking about it? Like, who wakes up in the morning and says, uh, this is day 2,468? You know, who does that? Someone who makes each day count. If you ask someone in addiction recovery, they'll be able to tell you how many days they have been sober. Why? Because they make each day count. Now, sometimes, like, I give them a hard time because they're starting to sound like those moms that are like, oh, my baby's 48 months old. <laughs> That's four years. You can say four years. You know, four years. Let's, 48 months. Come on, people. You know? Um, but anyways, um, but when you start making each day count, when you start winning a day at a time, you can start building a winning streak. Any sports fan can see the change in a team that takes place once they are in the middle of a major winning streak. Their confidence grows with each win. They make their own luck, and sometimes they just look unstoppable. The same can be true for you and I when it comes to whatever dream or goals that we may be chasing. Stack your days, get on a winning streak, and see how your confidence grows. So when Nehemiah and the people finished the wall, he didn't just say, we finished it eventually. No, in chapter 6, he says in verse 15, so on October 2nd, the wall was finished just 52 days after we had begun. And Nehemiah wasn't, was definitely counting the days to, to make sure that each day count. He even threw in a little sass in there, just 52 days. I mean, they've been working on, they've been working on 64 for like 70 years, you know? These people built a city in 52 days. Uh, but let's be honest. If you're going to complete a massive project the size of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem using a bunch of lay people in only 52 days, you're going to have to make each day count. And there was no, oh, didn't work today because the concrete guy never showed. Or there was no, we couldn't work because it rained. They made each day count, and so they counted the days. You know, Version, which is the company behind, uh, the people behind the Bible app, introduced the streaks feature in 2017. In their blog post introduce, introducing the feature, they said, we designed streaks specifically to help you build your habit of connecting with God through his word. If you're looking to get, get back into reading the Bible daily, streaks can help uh, take it one day at a time, stacking days as you go. Consistency is the key to long-term success when it comes to our habits. And reading your Bible is no different. Whatever your goal, start winning each day and making each day count. Get on a day winning streak and see how your confidence grows and your life changes. So Holman Wash went to the Niagara Gorge that day to win a $10 kite flying contest. He may have had no idea there was anything more to it than that. But when they got that first win, they started stacking wins, and pretty soon there was a bridge. They made each victory count, and each victory got them closer and closer to their goal. The same can happen for you, but you have to fly that kite first. So my hope with these habits is that you would use them to grow closer to Jesus. My hope is that you can use them to tell others about him and give God the glory for what he is doing in your life. My hope is that your life is a living sacrifice for him and a testimony of what he can do. You know, we have a tendency to dream small because we think only of what we can do. But maybe it's time to start dreaming big so that we can show what God can do. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 17, verse 20, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So dream big and then start small. You have to start somewhere. Expect that there will be moments of adversity and plan accordingly. And make every day count by counting the days. Do the little things like they are big things. And let God do the big things like they are small. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just, we thank you so much for, 
for all that you've done in our lives. Father, may we just come to a realization that, that we need to be fully reliant upon you in our lives. Father, may you show us the work that is set before us. And Father, may we have the faith to take that first step, that first small step. Father, maybe it's just hearing about a situation and praying about it. Father, maybe it's as simple as reaching out to a friend and listening to what's going on in their life. Father, show us the things that we should be doing in the communities that we live in so that we can make a difference and point people to you. May we be able to make a difference so big that people will know that it, that it, it all, could only be done by you. And may when that thing happens, may we point people to you. May we point them to to know who you are and to know who your son is. But Father, may you just show us the dreams, allow us to allow us to see the things that you want us to do in our lives and allow us to take that step, that small step of faith, flying the kite. May we be willing to do that. And Father, even when things don't go our way, when, when things seem tough, when things seem like, why did this happen to me? Father, may we revert back to our training. May we have these habits in place that, that we don't lose our faith. That we just go back to taking one small step at a time flying that kite to get, to get back to where we need to be and doing your work and overcoming these obstacles that are in front of us. So Father, just uh, be with us and continue to show us the things that we need to be doing in our lives for you here on this earth. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.